Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Welcome to this uh, FSU Far and Away presentation um, with Kay Ito and Andrew Kuiper. Um, before we begin, I do have a couple of acknowledgement uh, land acknowledgement statements that I'd like to make, um, and then I will introduce the artists and then we'll get started. So um, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that although we are hosting this event via the internet, that our physical bodies in this conversation are loca located on physical land. We acknowledge that the Facility for Arts Research at Florida State University is located on land that is the ancestral and traditional territory of the Appalachian Nation, the Muscogee Creek Nation, the Miccosukee Tribe of Florida, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. We pay respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to their descendants, to the generations yet unborn, and to all Indigenous people. We also acknowledge that Kay and Andrew are working, creating, and living on land that is the ancestral and traditional territory of the Susquehannock, Nanticoke, and Piscataway peoples. We recognize that this land remains scarred by the histories and ongoing legacies of settler, settler colonial violence, dispossession, and removal. In spite of all of this, and with tremendous resilience, these Indigenous nations have remained deeply connected to this territory, to their families, to their communities, and to their cultural ways of life. We recognize the ongoing relationships of care that these Indigenous nations maintain with this land and extend our gratitude as we live and work as humble and respectful guests upon their territory. We encourage you to learn about and amplify the contemporary work of the Indigenous nations whose land you are on and to endeavor to support Indigenous sovereignty in all ways that you can. Thank you for taking that moment with us. So um, tonight we are joined by Kay Ito and Andrew Kuiper, a, coll a collaborative pair from Baltimore, Maryland. I first uh, saw them speak at the 2019 Border Control New Media Caucus in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm glad to be introducing them tonight. So Kay Ito is a visual artist working primarily with experimental photography and installation, of art, installation art, and is currently teaching at the International Center of Photography in New York City. He received his MFA from Maryland Institute College of Art in 2016. Ito's work addresses issues of deep intergenerational loss and connections as he explores the materiality and experimental processes of photography, visualizing the invisible, such as radiation, memory, and life and death. Ito's work fundamentally is rooted in the trauma and legacy passed down from his late grandfather, a survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, meditates on the complexity of his identity and heritage through examining the past and current threats of nuclear disaster and his present status as a U.S. immigrant. Andrew Paul Kuiper is an artist and educator based in Mar Baltimore, Maryland, where he teaches at the Maryland Institute College of Art in the Animation and Film and Video programs. Working in sound, image, and installation, Andrew's work dances across boundaries of sound art, experimental music, and sound design. Field recordings, drones, drumming, and sound designed evocations of places, remote in time and place, commingle in Kuiper's work, inviting the audience to listen in ways they may not be accustomed to listening. Much of Andrew's work contemplates the legacy of his grandfather's role in the creation of the atomic bomb and the ramifications of atomic weaponry past and present. Andrew also maintains a practice as a sound designer for film and as a musician and audio engineer. Okay, so thank you. I will proceed into the Zoom space for now. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much. And thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, let me share the screen real quickly. Um, there we go. Can everyone see the image? Yes. <clears throat> So, and before we start, I, I want to double down on, on thanking Kylie for all the incredible work that you've done. You know, so often um, in these talks, folks end up kind of sometimes leaving a little bit early. So I just want to make sure that we, we um, get a chance to, to really, really um, state our gratitude to all the work you've done to coordinate this talk and the residency in general. So thank you so, so very much. Thank you so much. So yeah, like that we are collective, we work independently and we work collectively sometimes. Uh, but today's lecture, we're gonna focus on the, what we do together. Uh, but to get there, uh, let's individually talk about like who we are really quickly. Um, <clears throat> so as uh, Kylie mentioned, uh, I'm a photographer and installation artist. Uh, many of my works explore the theme of intergenerational trauma rooted in nuclear weapons and what it means for me to be in the United States as an immigrant and also as a third generation able victims. Um, I mainly utilize cameraless photography, which is instead of using a uh, a camera to make an image, I use experimental darkroom technique or modified historical archive to create my artwork. 
Uh, this practice actually came to me when I realized if a camera is a tool that captures something in front of you, then how do I capture something invisible, such as radiation, trauma, memory, and a liminal space between life and death? My answer was to get rid of the camera and use the most basic component of the photography, light and shadow. Uh, many, of the, many of my artwork has transformed both non-art and art space alike. Uh, these spaces are turned into temporal memorial uh, that then become a platform for the audience to explore social issues. Uh, they also stand as uh, monuments dedicated to the losses suffered from the consequence of those issues and how it affects us even today. <clears throat> Um, so before I can get into the uh, get into the project, so this is he. Uh, my grandfather is a root of my inspira inspiration, and the root of my uh, irradiated heritage. As my grandfather was in Hiroshima when a bomb exploded, he survived the bombing but lost most of his family member. <clears throat> uh, he was actually a profound anti nuclear activist. Uh, though when I, when I was nine years old, he passed away from cancer. <clears throat> Many of my projects were inspired by story of the irradiated trauma, including my grandfather, but not limited to. Um, also applied to the many other people who suffered from any nuclear related issue worldwide. Um, my artwork bridges these conflict and borders to create a, collect a collective and universal warning to today's nuclear tension. And the things I do with Andrew has a lot to do with this bridging the conflict, uh, which I can uh, uh, give the microphone to you, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you, Kay. So it's worth noting uh, right off the cuff here that um, the root of our collaboration, uh, something that we became aware of together very early on in our acquaintanceship when we were housemates at, uh, in grad school, a couple of weeks into grad school, we were talking to each other about you know, where we were from, um, where our families were from, and, and Kay told me that his grandfather had been in Hiroshima when the Americans dropped the atomic bomb there. And I told Kay, well, my grandfather helped to create the atomic bomb. Um, and so we, we committed ourselves in that moment to, to collaborate, which we eventually went on to do. Um, before we got there, you know, I, I found my way uh, from prior experience as an audio engineer and musician into you know figuring out how I would how I would use sound in my artwork. Um, so a major piece in my in my thinking with this was a piece called Rough Ride, which was about the, the Baltimore uprising. And the central insight for me in making this piece was that listening is a political act, and um, it is uh, something that we do all the time when listening. We make choices about what we want to listen to, how we want to listen, and what we want to perceive in our listening. And so I began to figure out a way by using more than one loudspeaker, working in what we call a multi-channel uh, audio installation kind of uh, technique, to force these kinds of decisions upon the listener, right? Uh, next slide, please. Right. So by the end of grad school, I found my way to the theme that, that Kay and I kind of share together, right, of our, our shared atomic heritage, working multi-channel, you can see her beautifully lit gallery full of loudspeakers, um, working in a way where if you go to the next slide, we'll see, um, I'm still forcing people to kind of engage with directionality, with uh, kind of different um, um, being pushed and pulled uh, kind of compositionally through time uh, to, to different loudspeakers. Keep going, keep going, right? So this is you know, just a couple of shots of how people tend to engage with my work. Um, sometimes my work, uh, is outside the gallery. Sometimes I'll install uh, loudspeakers in places where one might not expect them, uh, disguised perhaps as just part of the location, uh, like here, this installation uh, at pool number two in Baltimore, which was a site really important in the history of the desegregation of the city. Um, more recently, I've continued to work with loudspeakers on shelves, but in settings that are not strictly speaking gallery settings. This was a recent piece I did at a work share uh, uh, kind of office, basically, that, where there was an exhibition, right? I'm making a piece for the workers there. So I'm very interested in, in not just unique locations, but also kind of different audiences. Um, next slide, please. 
And this is how often how I work. Here I am in the woods uh, with some loudspeakers, or loudspeakers, some microphones, the opposite of loudspeakers on the ground, just recording the ambience of the space. And uh, this is a mode you'll see uh, represented again later on in our talk. So at the beginning of our collaboration together, um, we took a trip to see the Enola Gay, which is the, the bomber that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing, seeing us reflected um, you know, in, in one of the windows, it's right above the bomb site. And uh, you know, shortly after we, we took this picture, we had the opportunity to create our first fully collaborative piece together, which was called Ash Lexicon Silver Plate. And it was a piece that incorporated some elements that Kay already had in play in his work. So I'll, I'll let Kay take the microphone back. Sounds good. Um... So before we get, yeah, as Andrew was saying, like before he, we get into the Asha Lexicon Silver Plate, which was the one of the first collaborative piece we made together, um, I created, so this is a piece, uh, but I created something that's kind of like a wind back to um, how uh, this, the, some of the component that later used in Asha Lexicon, but was developed in a different way. Um, so many of my artwork is actually uh, rooted in the stories, uh, as I said in the introduction. Uh, so this particular uh, story came from uh, one of the book my grandfather wrote. Uh, he was an academic, so he wrote several books that I didn't get to you know, learn from him personally, but I actually later learned about it um, through his books and uh, secondhand um, story my grandmother told me in about. Um, so after, right after the moment my grandfather survived the explosion of the bombing, uh, my grandfather ran back to the home, uh, his family home, which was located near the ground zero. When he reached the house, he realized almost everything, comf almost, uh, everything house inside and outside was completely burnt. Um, and in the ruin of his house, he found his cherished Japanese dictionary completely burned, yet retaining the shape of a book, just like that you seen in this photograph. Um, and as he gets closer to the book, he noticed that the white page turned into black and the black ink turns into white, as you can kind of see it here. Uh, and he wrote it in the book saying that as if he was looking at the photographic negative. And that story fascinated me, this idea of this burnt dictionary that he cherished so much, is the, it reminded him of a film negative. And when he left the house, this is the only thing he carried. He took the handful of the ash, put it into the pocket, and he left the house. Uh, so this story was really, really impactful when it comes to like art making. Um, so I ended up finding an identical dictionary to my grandfather's book in the Japanese uh, vintage bookstore, and I brought it back here in the United States and burnt it. Surprisingly, the same effect happened. Um, I ended up making a piece with uh, the dictionary juxtaposed with uh, the photograph, um, but I, it, I wasn't quite satisfied with the form. Um, I think there was a disconnect between the picture and the dictionary. So I kind of wanted to evolve the project. Uh, and then that's how I started to break down the dictionary and stuffing them into these uh, canister, film canister from World War II. And I did it 408 times representing, it's a theme in my art, uh, art making, but it represents uh, redemption uh, in Japanese Buddhism and my childhood. So I'm using that number 108 to create this um, piece and many other pieces. but this one particularly, I stuffed the one dictionary into the 108 canisters and placed them on the, the two by four stud. And uh, this was originally, um, wouldn't call it commissioned, but we are given the space uh, in a play gallery in Baltimore, and I asked Andrew if he wanted to uh, be part of the project. Um, and you know, he we we was we've been thinking about creating a project together. And yeah, uh, do you want to talk about the, how the journey went, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. So this was our first chance to collaborate, as you said, and and um, 
we were not only collaborating with each other, figuring out how to do that, but collaborating with this space. You can see that this is quite a constricted little space here. We originally thought we'd have one single beam and, and kind of forced us to do these two, one over the other, which then when, when uh, I lit it, <laughs> it gave this incredible X on the ground, which brought in another layer, right? And so he, here we were finding opportunities in, in kind of restrictiveness of the venue. Um, Another element of that was that you know, I was forced to kind of put the loudspeakers up high, which emphasized the directionality again, you know, of where the sound was coming from. The sound of the piece is uh, kind of a fever dream interpretation of a lost recording made of the bombing run on Hiroshima on what was called a wire recorder. You know, some, kind of the cousin of a, of a tape recorder, but literally on a spool of wire. Um, not trying to naturalistically portray it, but maybe capture something of the mood. And so, you know, here in this early collaboration, uh, you know, it, it was already clear to me that, um, you know, Kay, Kay's contributions to the piece were doing really important work. They're so visually striking and uh, materially um, potent. I had to take care not to just try to do the same work that his elements were, were contributing. So um, finding that I could kind of change the, the, the tone of the space and yeah, you can go ahead and play it. I'll talk over it a little bit mm -hmm. and kind of set, set a mood um, right off the bat was my agenda for our collaboration, right? In some later works, my audio is a lot more elaborate, but in this piece, it was pretty simple. You'll hear it shortly. I don't really hear it. <laughs> Are you, you hearing hear it? it? No. I'm hearing it, but not on your side. Oh, there it is. It might be coming through your microphone. Um, so um, perhaps setting your Zoom or your, your, your Mac OS out, audio output to Zoom device. Or something like that. Why don't you Why don't you share the screen if you have a okay. the okay the thing you're about? Yeah, I'll try technology, right? <laughs> it's about to happen. <laughs> I actually have just the file straight up um, at hand for a different presentation I'm giving. So, give me one moment here, and we'll try that. Well, while Andrew is working on, uh, let me talk about a little bit of like how, like I, in, you know, in the introduction, I mentioned about I'm a photographer, but even though I'm a photographer, this piece doesn't really have any photographic component. It's not light sensitive. It doesn't use camera. It doesn't print it on something. It's literally ash, you know, stuffed inside of the film canister. But here I'm trying to imply the idea of the photography and questioning like if if I imply the idea of the photography, can it be a photographic installation? Um, so that's the kind of the stuff I really interested in, in as well uh, as, a, as a photographer and an artist, pushing the media as much as possible. Uh, oh, there we go. We hear it. Cool. So, um, Kay, do you want to jump back and do the, the slideshow for a bit? Well, since or we have I? multiple like audio piece, you should okay, have I'll a keep, screen. Keep going with it. All right. You just... Fair enough. Um, cool. All right. Share. Nope, not share. Mm -hmm. Ha, I don't use Google Slides. So oh, often. yeah. It's, oh. It's, uh, it's a slideshow yeah. right there. <laughs> Oh, Lordy. All right. I'm going to have to kind of jump on through these and get us caught back up. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. Right, right, right. We saw this. Um, okay. Well, cool. I'm just glad the audio is coming out. Yeah. It got me worried a little bit. <laughs> Hopefully it continues to work. 
All right, so we were there and now we are here. So this is a view of the same piece um, a few years later at a museum in North Carolina called Sika. We were invited by an incredible curator and friend, now friend, who is in the audience named Wendy mm -hmm. Earl to, to bring our work down to Sika. And we got to kind of reimagine the work and see it with a little more space to breathe. So thank you, Wendy, for that life-changing opportunity. Okay, so um, shortly after we made this piece, we had the chance to uh, um, collaborate on a, uh, an application, actually. <laughs> uh, we, we submitted an application for a grant called the, the Ruby's Artist Grant here in Baltimore. It's a substantial grant, and we, we proposed to do a, a rather substantial piece together, never thinking that we would actually win the thing. And then we won the thing. <laughs> which was amazing and terrifying because uh, we were on the hook to produce something uh, of epic mm -hmm. scale. We proposed to make 108 human-sized photograms, the kinds of prints you saw Kay show earlier, and uh, to go out to New Mexico and so I could make field recordings out there at uh, atomic heritage sites, meaning locations significant in the history of, of you know, atomic history. Um, and I proposed to well, kind of particularly Los Alamos is the place yeah. that they first tested the nuclear weapon and well that they developed it, it yeah. yeah yeah they developed it there and then and then tested it down the Trinity test site uh, uh, way south um, so we proposed to do this and, and and then we had the chance to actually go do it after after struggling for a bit to find the right venue for the show right so um, here is the view from the mesa as you're working your way up to to Los Alamos which was you know a, a secret lab up up on this plateau during World War II, where they did the kind of really core scientific work of developing you know, how they would produce the bomb, right? Um, so elements of it still look exactly as it did in the in the 1940s. They kind of preserved the gate there. We met uh, they became a tourist area. Mm -hmm. We met a, a friend when we were visiting there, you know, a friend of mine from online who I who I had become acquainted with, a, a nuclear anthropologist named Marty Pfeiffer. Who is brilliant and has incredibly entertaining and sometimes dire Twitter. Uh, great fellow. So Marty showed us around the museums there and gave us his his really really deep and um, well studied insights. Here I am trying to protect my, myself from the sun um, as a silly Easterner in a cowboy hat. And once again, you see me with a, a microphone with a, you know uh, some fur on it to protect it from the wind. It's called a dead cat of all names trying to record very quiet things in this very quiet place and often picking up a lot of like the trucks a few miles away instead. Um, here's the setup I was working with back then. Beautiful place to be working. Um, Awe-inspiring place to work, right? Um, Kay you know, did a lot of photography out there and here's Kay um, battling <laughs> out against a, a missile, <laughs> right? So I, I brought with me a camera from the 1940s and it was often used as like a, a you know, um, Kind of word documentarian sort of camera, and you know, end up taking pictures down near the the Trinity test site that uh, kind of posed the sun in the sky about where the the, you know, the test would have been uh, as a kind of homage to to a piece Kay showed earlier, uh, doing much the same thing in, in Hiroshima. All right, so it was really quite a, a remarkable trip, and you know, this set us on a, a path that we've maintained of taking great pains to go to the places where history happened or to find objects that are authentically connected to uh, you know, the, the history of, of atomic weaponry, either because of the material they're made of or where they're from or the era, right? So, so we learned so much when you're out there, which um, in this case set us up to, to produce the piece, which looks like this. So the I, I want to quickly add a thing about like what you just said about history. Um, so we we really try to think uh, material uh, history and a story as a type part of the material as a crucial component to create an artwork. Uh, sometimes that influenced a certain process, a certain venue, and uh, I think both uh, this after image requiem actually encompass like all of the aspect we wanted to show in the project. Uh, do you mind if I talk about a little bit about Baltimore War Memorial? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so After Image Requiem first debuted at the Baltimore War Memorial uh, in 19, uh, 2019, uh, wait, 2018, 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the reasons we chose the building was 
if we ever undergo an actual nuclear, nuclear missile attack in DC and Baltimore area, this building, Baltimore War Memorial, is the place that they would be doing uh, used as a makeshift hospital for triage purpose. Um, thus, the wounded people laid on the ground, similar to how you see my prints on the ground. Uh, so that there's a significance in the location as well. Um, so that's a kind of the thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, since the prince is in, uh, yeah, uh, could you pause there? Uh, could you go back one? Yeah. Yeah. So I created these prints by exposing the darkroom paper uh, called C print. Uh, it's a color darkroom paper to the sunlight with my body on top, uh, which refers to the engraved people's shadow near Hiroshima and Nagasaki Ground Zero. Could you go next one? Um, the heat of the explosion was so hot that it's actually meet the, the temperature of the core of the sun, vaporizing people's body right away. Uh, my grandfather's sister was one of the person who working at the ground zero, meaning her body was vaporized right away. Uh, and some of the some of the case you can actually see that these shadow engraved on the ground. Uh, people refer it as the Hiroshima shadow or Nagasaki shadow, uh, particularly one on the right. Um, this is a shadow of the person sitting on the um, uh, on a step. It, they, uh, the Hiroshima Peace Museum actually cut it out and have it as a prominent exhibit in the museum. Uh, and seeing that uh, when I was a child, uh, it's gave a certain traumatic response, a memory that kind of stick to me till today. And since I couldn't get to talk about it, uh, could you go to the next slide, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, since I didn't really talk about like the reason why I use sunlight was, um, so at the grandfather's deathbed, uh, I was asked, you know, I was nine years old. I wish I asked certain questions like, what was, it like to be in Hiroshima and like what was the traumatic event, but I was nine, I wasn't listening, you know, what my grandfather was saying. But one thing I remember him telling me at the deathbed was the Hiroshima was like a hundreds of sun lighting up the sky. And that story of hundreds of suns influenced me as a photographer to the point that I exclusively use sunlight exposing these uh, color darkroom, typically use the color darkroom exposure unit, but instead I use sunlight, which I don't have a control over. Morning, night, cloudy, depending on the day, the shades of the red, the intensity of the black changes all the time. Uh, and I ended up using my body exposed to the sunlight just briefly, um, like duration of the breath, essentially, um, and creating 108 of these prints creating kind of like idea of connected uh, universal trauma uh, through my, you know, showing my personal trauma. Um, could you go to the next one? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's kind of like also the idea of the radiation, like the how nuclear weapon differs from other weapon is the nuclear weapon emits radiation that can be st stay inside of the one's body for a long time. My grandfather suffered from uh, leukemia and cancer throughout his life. Uh, and there's not enough research that determine if the children of the, the Avon victims or grandchildren of the Avon victims, such as myself, has any consequence of these radiation. Uh, so like using my own body uh, is part of the idea that I want to inscribe my trauma inside on, on, onto the prints. Um, and the space was lit with a single spotlight, uh, just so you can see it here, uh, casting the audience's shadow on my prints. And by seeing their own shadows overlapping with my body uh, on the prints, I, you know, we are hoping that people would realize that this issue of the nuclear weapon is ongoing, not the thing of the past. Uh, so like this is a way of uh, us to bridging the history to today's contemporary issue. And this was another element that you know, we hadn't anticipated when we devised the piece. 
in our in our heads. It was getting getting to the venue and realizing that the the chandeliers up above provided both inadequate <laughs> light and also very um, glary light that drove us to you know, to get this bright spotlight, which added this drama and kind of really changed the the mood of the piece. All right. So sound wise, kind of become a theme. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sound wise, you know, there's four loudspeakers. If I go back up and show you the whole space, you'll see in the in the front left and right of the stage, there's two there. And there's two kind of um, the bottom corners that are lost in shadow here. Um, the two far ones play out sounds that I sound designed, kind of imagining the processes of the creation of the bomb. And the two loudspeakers kind of closer to us play out sounds, you know, the sounds that I recorded out in New Mexico, or these kind of natural sounds. Right. And so a major theme of the piece for me is kind of thinking through, you know, what is natural, what is unnatural. Here they were on the mesa in, in, in the desert in this very natural place, doing what we think of as un, very unnatural things, but using very natural resources as kind of um, rare as they were. Right. So kind of really trying to think through and break down some of these ideas. Um, unlike Kay, I, I know virtually nothing about what my grandfather did in his life. He was a very secretive person, although I, I, my research has led me closer and closer to figuring out what he was up to, right? And so my entry point into so much of this is kind of thinking through what, what, what did people like my grandfather do? What did people like my grandfather experience? What was the social um, climate of the times? What was the political climate of the times? Um, what sort of processes you know, were they undertaking technically? What did these things sound like? No one living knows what a lot of these processes sounded like. Um, and some of them, if you could hear them, you would be killed, <laughs> right? Because they're very dangerous. So trying to impose an impression of these spaces over the space we're in, you know, to kind of create a, a dialogue with Kay's work. And again, not to replicate what Kay is doing, but to, to kind of set up uh, you know, uh, in kind of an alternative space and kind of ghostly hanging over it, right? So. We'll play out a little bit of the audio from it. This first sequence you'll hear is kind of imagining the coming of war, right? So as secrecy and um, the security culture envelop the scientific world, and the beating of the and the beating droning of of airplanes kind of come to come to envelop the space. And so, if you can't hear it, let me know. Interest of time, I'm going a bit. 
say a couple more things about about the War Memorial. First of all, it, it's a little funny for me to be playing this out in Zoom, which makes everything mono, meaning only one channel of sound. There's a four channel piece reduced in the documentation then to two channels and now you get mono. <laughs> so if any of you want to hear the entire piece, uh, I actually have an annotated version of, of the audio that kind of explains what you're hearing. I'd be happy to share that with anyone who wants it. Um, another little thing to say about the piece, it was originally a World War I memorial and that's extremely significant to us, right? So there's a clear line between the names of the Marylanders on the wall and what they experienced with the advent of mechanized warfare, with with industrial warfare, to you know where, where you go from like you know soldiers killing each other one by one to mustard gas to the advent of strategic bombing, meaning you're not bombing soldiers, you're bombing cities. And then in World War II, we get many, 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 many bombers, you know, massed bombers bombing cities. So it's a, a short jump from there to have instead of a thousand bombers to have one bomber with one very big bomb. So there's a direct through line from you know, what this building memorializes to what we sought to memorialize in this piece. Um, we had the good luck of uh, bringing this piece as well down to Sika. So thank you, Wendy. Um, and reimagining it a little bit for this space where it was a, a little bit of a smaller room, but with these beautiful walls. So you know, the piece took on a different rhetoric um, when, when the prints were up on the wall right, and took on maybe the visage of, of souls ascending up from this calamity, right? Is there anything you wanted to add about this Sika installation, Kay? No, I, I think you covered it. Um, it's essentially like if the Baltimore War Memorial was indeed a memorial, this space felt like more like a cathedral. This has like a more towering, like, you know, on the Baltimore War Memorial, the relationship with you and the prince is still looking down, but when you go into the Sika, you know, as Andrew was saying, it's almost ascending feel to it. So it became much more spiritual uh, than uh, what we intended for the Baltimore War Memorial. And I think both like experience is like uh, equally good. Uh, I actually do like Sika exhibit a little bit more than Baltimore War Memorial, um, just because like how much like how immersive this can be um if i was allowed i would have put it on the wall too i mean on the ceiling as well <laughs> and remarkably uh, uh despite this being a very different shaped room the acoustics were almost identical <laughs> it sounded the same i didn't have to change the sound at all there's another piece that we we produced um well, that we produced you know for this show is one that some of you might have become familiar with uh, down at FSU, New Light Narrowcast, which was the first you know, film that we made together. Right? So here it was at at uh, Sika, and in a moment I'll let Kay tell you about you know the the, the visual element. But I want to note this odd looking sound system. Um, the the PA for it, so to speak, was a radio from you know World War II, an AM radio, to which I I transmitted via AM signal the the set, the audio. Um, and we'll get back to that shortly. But Kay, do you want to talk about you know what we're seeing here when we're seeing? Sure. This? Um, so when essentially we got to have a show at the Sika, uh, and there's a one like we wanted to create some specific uh, new piece for the Sika space, and that was around the time that I got uh, I noticed the U.S. government actually declassified many of the nuclear testing footage from Cold War published on of all the place on YouTube. Um, so I actually had access to it uh, for probably 50 some uh, nuclear footage, uh, nuclear testing footage. Some of the nuclear footage is as short as five seconds. Some of them is like 30, you know, 30 seconds, but relatively short. So what I did was I actually essentially made, uh, took a screenshot of each uh, film and made it into a uh, transparency. And with that transparency, I exposed them to a tinted sunlight to get this lime, almost irradiated green, uh, to make these prints. Uh, Sometimes I place an object on top of it. Um, and what I did afterwards was I scanned every single frame on the print. So I scanned entirely of this uh, print then I crop to each one of them um, 
uh, what do you call it, uh, the frame and recompose them into uh, essentially a stop animation. Uh, so the left is the original um, print I made and the right side is um, the resulting GIF or the video. And as you can see, like this has probably 80 to some frames only lasting for like three seconds or two seconds of the video. Uh, I continue doing so. I think I use 58 prints uh, in order to make uh, a, a video that's lasts around three minutes and 50 seconds, I think. Uh, and that was like a, one of the most labor intensive project or besides after image requiem that I took on. Uh, but I think the resulting image is quite fascinating. Um, and also like the, 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 the aspect I wanted to bring with this project was a downwinder. Downwinders are the people, uh, people in the United States that exposed to radiation by living in near the nuclear testing sites, such as Utah, uh, Nevada, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, these are people still living who are suffering from leukemia and cancer because the government couldn't let people know the issue of the radiation. Part, partially, they didn't even know like how threatening the issue was. Um, so this is my way of bridging these two gap again uh, to create, you know, voicing this issue by using these uh, nuclear testing that was conducted on the US land. So speaking of voicing, you're voicing it. Um, we talked about the radio, what was playing from it. The main, the main element of the audio, and I'll play it brief, uh, briefly for you in a second, is me reading a poem that I wrote, which, um, again, in a fever dreamed sort of way, imposes the experience of the downwinders over imagined future uh, victims of atomic war, right? Kind of thinking through all the different kind of elements of, of deterrence theory policy that I know over the experiences of the downwinders and people working at the test sites and you know the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and these future future victims to come. Um, a major touchstone for me in creating this was uh, the Elder Edda, right? So this is kind of Norse poetry, Viking poetry basically, uh, often dealing with the end of the world, kind of like thinking through the end of, of the, uh, the end of times. Right. Um, in one of these poems, there's a really sassy witch who is giving a prophecy to, to Odin, to Odin, you know, saying occasionally, like, hey, do you understand yet or what? Right. So that's kind of a major refrain in, in this poem, um, because often I have a feeling of desperation that people really don't understand the risks and the dangers of this. And well, this last week, maybe in some way they are beginning to. But uh, here's a little bit of the audio along with the video. So if you if you go to our website, you can uh, check out this piece in its entirety, uh, or or stop by you know, where FSU's um, that was department, say. <laughs> yeah, as far as is uh, is is exhibiting it for the next couple of days as well. Mm -hmm. um, cool onward. So yep. So here's another exhibition view of it. Uh, the lovely folks at Sika were subjected to days and days of this this radio <laughs> literally vibrating violently fr from the sounds you were hearing. So sorry to everyone in North Carolina for that. <laughs> and then thank you for your tolerance. So the next piece we made together was um, we, we should we should skip. We 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 are already 745. So okay. I think we should go to uh, either cat uh, black oh. box piece or uh, should, this place is a message. So look at it really quickly. There's a piece we made together for uh, an exhibition we, we took part in. Um, 
for a prize we did not win, <laughs> the Sondheim uh, Artscape <laughs> Prize, right? So again, using loudspeakers with with uh, with images and a spotlight and kind of themes here that are familiar, right? Okay, so uh, a year ago we were in planning about to be in production for a piece called "This Place Is a Message," and the title is drawn from the message, uh, uh, an imagined message devised by. Sure. <laughs> <My bad. laughs> devised by by, by uh, you know, San Diego National Laboratories, kind of a nuclear lab out in New Mexico, to think, well, if we're storing you know, atomic waste for centuries and millennia, one day people won't know it's there. So how do we communicate to them that it's there, right? And so they created this very strange, uncanny text, beginning with the line, this place is a message to deal with that. Um, and so this piece uh, was an, an, uh, an outdoor installation piece which we installed at a, a wonderful kind of gallery called Art Yard up in New Jersey. And they let us use an actual art yard, an actual yard <laughs> at their residency to do this. And so we created 108 cubes, mm -hmm. each of which entombs a roll of film. And I'll let Kay talk about that in a moment, uh, two channel audio piece. But uh, before we talk more in detail about what's in, in these, we'll talk about the location. So this is New Jersey, you know, where, you know, near where I grew up. Um, along the Delaware River, which is, you can see through the trees there, right? Down the river from this location in Philadelphia is where my grandfather worked during World War II, uh, a place called Midvale Steel, which is now a SEPTA a bus depot, right? So this was a, a, a plant that pre, uh, produced munitions for warships, you know, armor for warships, experts in, in, in cast, casting high quality steel. My research shows that they were asked to create the gun barrel that shot the two pieces of uranium together inside the bomb, which detonated over Hiroshima, as well as some other, other things. Um, my suspicion about what my grandfather did there was that he was a radiologist. So uh, he probably x-rayed this, this um, gun barrel as a quality check, right? So in thinking about this river, I think a lot about my grandfather, about what he did down the river from here Right, um, and so that was kind of part of my access into thinking about this this location. Um, so we created these 108 cubes. the The whole row is the length of a B twenty nine bomber, and I'll let Kate tell you what's inside of them. Sure, and uh, one thing to point out: could you go back one? Yeah, uh, a little bit. So, like the, on the other end, the way it's pointing at, it's where like the general direction of where Hiroshima is. Um, so that's kind of like a connecting Andrew's heritage and my heritage together. Right. Um, you can just go past the. Um, <laughs> just here we are. Yeah. The piece. You can just getting, uh, keep going. Getting very very gross, <laughs> um, using fire and and some household chemicals to rust the steel plates that you see on top of the cubes. Keep going until uh, we see uh, the film. So each individual concrete cube contain one single uh, unexposed or exposed film, but not developed. Uh, meaning there's an image exists on it, but to in order to see the image, you need to develop the film uh, or process the film. Uh, I expose them to a secret material that I gathered and I use the same material for 108 imagely, not using a camera, but lot, rather, uh, again, uh, cameraless photography. Only I know the imagely, or even I don't even know the imagely because I haven't processed the film yet. Um, all 108 are unique and entombed inside of uh, the concrete cube. Uh, one is the idea of the concrete was the uh, reflect, reflection of the Chernobyl's uh, tomb or coffin. Um, one, one of the way to contain the radiation is to use concrete. So we wanted to use that idea, but also like to entomb such um, irradiated trauma. Um, I just, yeah, that concrete was just such an amazing uh, material to use. Mm -hmm. uh, so only way for the, the anyone else besides me to know what's inside of the film is to physically either steal the, the concrete cube or bring a sledgehammer, smash them and take the film and take it to the photo you know, store to process it. But um, we haven't seen yet anyone so bold to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was interesting to kind of come up and visit the site again and again, 
during the the many months of its uh, installation and see the ways that the um, the grass grew up around it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'll come back and play briefly for you a little bit of the audio. Uh, at the end of the summer, the site was flooded out uh, by the hurricane <laughs> that, that struck in early September. And you see here my equipment that was in this nice, cool, dry garage uh, destroyed by that. So the unexpected joys of working um, sometimes in, in site-specific installation. So the audio... simply an evocation of mid bale steel, of, of the, the steel foundry where my grandfather was a radiologist, right? And um, we had an unexpected chorus to collaborate with this summer with, of the cicadas. So that was an interesting thing to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hear how my audio was changed by this chorus of droning cicadas. Um, by the end of the, the run, you know, the, the grass had grown high over the cubes and we talked about on different quality altogether. So the last piece we want to show you tonight is kind of successor piece to this, mm -hmm. thinking about interiority, um, thinking about this, um, this kind of warning message, right? And it's a piece that is installed currently at your lovely art museum at FSU called Black Box Cat, <laughs> right? So um, here it is, as described, a black box, uh, which is a term used in kind of like information theory, and in science for a closed system, right? So we're, th we're thinking this piece about you know, secrecy as we so often do <laughs> because of the nature of the work we're doing. And we were thinking about, um, you know, of course, you know, the, the, the message, that, that kind of warning message. We were thinking about cats as I often do, right? We all know about, about that, that very uncertain cat in the box, which may be alive or may not be alive. Well, this cat is not alive. It's made of uranium glass or Vaseline glass, which is a glass that uses a little bit of uranium for its green coloring. And if you hit it with UV light or black light, it, it glows green. So this is not a light bulb. It's, it's a piece of glass being um, that is fluorescing because of the black light that we're hitting it with, right? Um, so here's a little video and you can hear the audio. You'll hear the drum roll uh, playing, you'll hear cat purring and some droning of machinery. Themes that uh, you're probably familiar with by now. So I've been a drummer since I was 10, but I'm increasingly interested in the content of, you know, what, what, what does the drum set as an instrument mean? Its meaning has kind of changed considerably over the 140 years of its existence. Um, and that's something that I'll, I'll keep working with as we go forward. But here's the cat. So this is our latest and greatest, and, and uh, we made it for you. <laughs> so we hope that you get a chance to go over and, and take a, a look and a listen at this piece, trying to advance the slide. So here we are, uh, and here's our social media if you want to uh, give us a follow on Instagram, right? We can pop that in the chat for you, but we're gonna shut our traps now and address any questions you have. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kay and Andrew. Um, I wrote down so many questions, but I want to go ahead and open the floor to anyone else who either wants to chat their message, like type it in the chat, or if you want to, if you want to be part of the recording, you can turn on your video and your, in your, uh, microphone now. Um, so are there any questions? We apologize for pushing time a little bit. Um, we usually like our presentation usually like pushes time sometime, but I hope we, we are willing to stay longer uh, for the talk and a QA. and a So if anyone's willing to stay with us, uh, we can talk about it a little bit longer. Sorry about that. Well, I have, I have a question. Um, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so the number 108 Mm -hmm. uh, is significant in Japanese Buddhism, you said, mm -hmm. but I think it's also a universal, has universal significance in other, 
um, other religions. I think Fibonacci also Probably. referred to the number 108. Um, and I was just doing a quick Google check and there are 108 stitches on a baseball. Um, huh. So that's, <laughs> that's a little fun fact for your next cocktail party. But um, I just was wondering if you ever think about, about it as um, in more universal terms, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the Fibonacci principle in Jewish numerology also, 108 is a significant number. So I know that it's significant um, in, many, mm -hmm. in many cultural realms. 100%. Uh, it 108 kind of came to be um, without a solid number. I would continue making until like one ten, tens of thousands of the prints. Um, but 108 kind of fitted so nicely because of the it's a uh, it's the manifestation of idea of redemption, which is what I think about a lot. my identity, who I am living in the United States as a third generation victim. This idea of the redemption is a huge part of my art making. And by using specific a ritualistic number 108, uh, you by using this number, my art making became a uh, ritualistic uh, printmaking. And to me, that aspect of the 108 feels very strongly resonated in me. Uh, yes, uh, I think it does have a other cultural significance elsewhere. Uh, and I do want to incorporate that, but I don't think this idea, like a core idea of the 108 will still stay in uh, the, my heritage and my childhood, um, if that makes sense. But thank you, no, thank you for letting me know. That's that's really good to know, and uh, I'm gonna research into it. Maybe maybe new meaning emerged through by you know talking to people. So I, that's really exciting. Yeah, Judah, thank you for for mentioning that it's a, a number with, that's significant in um, in uh, Jewish numerology. I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, where I'm headed with my work probably in the near future is kind of addressing some of the knots that are tied in my my heart and my head right now, thinking about my grandfather, my grandmother uh, fleeing as a baby, basically from Ukraine, right? Uh, as her father fled pogroms and brought her and her, her sister to, to the States, right? Even as some of her other siblings died along the way. Um, and then she kind of went back and realized this was not a place you know, uh, that, that she could, could raise her son when she was a little bit older, came back to the States and married my grandfather who, you know, shortly thereafter is working on the weapon that now Putin uses to shield himself as he attacks Ukraine, right? So all this is becoming more entwined in my, in my head and in my heart. And, um, um, you know, I've been thinking about that quite a bit. So I'll be interested to, to learn what its significance is in Jewish, in Jewish um, numerology. So thank you for that. There's a question in the chat from um, from Annika Culver, and she first says, "Thanks for an impactful presentation, and excellent art with great meaning." Um, and her question is, "How do you see yourselves as educators about the dangers of nuclear war?" That's the kind of a interesting thing to talk about. Uh, can Can I go first, Andrew? So my grandfather was an activist. Uh, actually, he was a quite profound anti-nuclear anti -nuclear activist who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, but Mother T Teresa took it away from him. But you know, good competition and all. Um, my grandfather was an activist. I am not. Um, I'm. I always stand in. So my identity is a liminal space between this idea of yes, the nuclear weapon is bad, and I'm definitely anti-nuclear weapon, but without it, I wouldn't exist. You know, this kind of like war is never is one-sided. It's idea of this complication and both of the side always have a casualty, quote unquote, sacrifice. Um, and to me, that is very interesting and that can only be exposed or expressed within the art. Um, and to me, art, the, the being the artist is to question something or propose the question to the audience to, you know, ask themselves about how their life and how they, in this term, the, how we deal with the nuclear weapon is. Um, 
And in that regard, I want my artwork to be an educator, my artwork and story embedded in the artwork to be an activist, but my, not myself. Um, so like I, I tend to, because I understand both sides and without it, I wouldn't be collaborating with Andrew, which is whom, you know, his grandfather, you know, caused my, essentially my grandfather's death. But, you know, like I don't blame him for it it was a war. Japanese government did, or Japanese imperial army did some terrible, terrible thing. So like, I, I really do think it's not really about the victimhood, but rather it's much more complicated thing that uh, sometimes activism can overlook and could be one-sided, but I want to be more about um, the complexity of these things. Um, that's been said, uh, we have collaborated or worked with uh, anti-nuclear activists or activist group, and we are all for it because uh, we are just providing the platform uh, and let them do like the, the actually reaching out to the people. Yeah, I'd agree that on a basic level, just the, the fact of our collaboration and our friendship hopefully stands as a symbol for mm -hmm. the possibilities of, of peace and, and hope. Um, but you know, it's funny for, for a couple of a couple of folks who are working so much with history, history, history. You know, we also hope that that our insistence on the current relevance, the mm -hmm. ongoing danger of this, gets through to people. Right. Um, right now, it's easy to remember that with what's going on in the world. But oftentimes, we we set the fact that these weapons are always always uh, armed and ready to go aside. Mm -hmm. right? It's hard to to keep that in in your mind. Um, that's an ugly thing to think about. So. Hopefully, by making work that is not itself necessarily ugly, we can lure people into contemplating it and taking action on it. Any other questions, folks? Um, if it's okay, I'd, I'd like to ask a question really yeah. quick. Um, specifically, when you were talking about kind of working backwards and figuring out what your grandfather was doing or who he was. Um, I really related to that on kind of a different level because a lot of my work is about backtracking similar um, histories with only like documents or um, familial stories. And so I'm just kind of curious for you, like how important do you think it is to carry on kind of gener generational mythologies? Um, like, do you consider them motivational um and i'm sorry i i like this word a lot do you consider them kind of like magic there's a lot of like ritual and um importance that comes when we when we retell the same stories or we give them this weight so i'm just kind of wondering how you feel about that i, th I you want to go first andrew yeah if you don't mind yeah I, I i absolutely think that that's the case the older i get the more i care about about this about trying to figure these things out about trying to figure out who my forebears were um, and of course, you know, with, with the current with current events, you know, my connection to Ukraine becomes profoundly more important to me. You know, I, I went in, in a relatively short time to from feeling like I don't know that I'd ever want to go there. It's you know that was then to now feeling like oh, oh man, <laughs> I hope one day I can visit and, and see a Ukraine restored. Um, and and likewise, you know, my research has led me to all these kind of documents. Um, Ancestry.com is an interesting place, and you never know what you'll find, right? So, uh, on the other side of my family, it turns out that my grandfather was a, a, a foreman in a factory, or as the census said, an inventor. I don't understand that. Um, at a factory that contributed other important work to, to uh, the creation of the bomb, um, he wasn't doing that work at all. I can tell you that. Um, but you never, you never know, right? So, really, kind of coming to terms with all this and understanding in a deep way. Um, the, the generational traumas and 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 uh, triumphs, right, of, of kind of like survival, uh, becomes more important to me the older I get. So definitely, yeah. Kay, do you, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hundred um, percent. It's uh, so I always think about um, so my artwork is rooted in you know pure inspiration. Core inspiration comes from my grandfather and the gener uh, generational trauma. And I have explored so much that I even went back to Japan to talk to some of the one of the 
still remaining friend that my grandfather knew about uh, fled to Hiroshima together. But I'm getting to the point, and now I'm living in the United States long enough that I have a green card, I have a permanent resident. I start noticing the same trauma happened in many countries in many different places. And in a way, I'm that influences me and that became my part of the collective memory. Uh, so like I do make work about downwinders. I do make work about the worker at the Chernobyl, but it still is connected through the thread of my grandfather's experience. Uh, so that is like, it, it essentially it, my generational trauma allows me to branch out to talk about much global scale of the, um, the trauma. And one of the biggest thing I'm focusing right now is not the, the victim of today, but a victim of the future. Uh, the people who will be suffering from these nuclear weapon and nuclear attack in the future. Uh, this, um, the, the, I, I call it docu-fiction, uh, documentary fiction. Uh, that's a, something I'm, I'm really, really, um, uh, something like focusing on right now. Uh, so yeah, like I think the heritage does influence, but I think that the word heritage can be much bigger than who strictly who you are, but it could be the collective trauma, collective history with the other people who suffered from the similar issue. Um, so I think that's the something I think about. And there's a great question in the chat that picks up from there, kind of actually. I, I can read it if y'all want. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Kay. It's from Emily Liu. Thank you, Kay and Andrew. Uh, for Kay, since you mentioned this generational trauma, I was wondering how does your family or other descendants of a bomb survivors view your work and the expressions of such trauma? Um, it's a funny thing. Um, I realized as an, uh, an artist in the United States, um, and I started expressing this matter in the United States, my core audience always has been American and the West. Uh, as a matter of fact, I haven't really shown my piece in Japan. Uh, I've shown in Asia, I've shown in Europe, and definitely I've shown many times in the United States, but that's like, when I think about audience, it's not for the Japanese, we know the trauma. We are trying to, and Japan is not the, one who would be triggering the nuclear war. Um, so when we think about that, the major nuclear power such as United States and Russia uh, are the, my uh, prime um, audience. So, but my family have visited uh, the Baltimore War Memorial exhibit uh, after image Requiem and my mom started crying and like, it's, uh, I, it, it's good to hear that even within the people who already know this issue so much still can resonate with the people. Um, so yeah, I, I don't wanna limit it, but the, if I think about audience, it will be the United States and Europe. And Emily goes on to ask me, um, and Andrew, how and why did you choose the soundscape engine worrying for uh, perhaps for the exhibition? So the piece, it's like maybe about 35 minutes long or so after Minjokum. And you know, there, there are many, many sequences, many different elements. Um, but you kind of you pull out you know, whirring sounds. Whirring sounds are very, very important to me. Uh, uh, before I began um, doing this work, I did I created a lot of drone music. And when I say drone music, I mean music without melody, with sustained long tones or textures, right? And I was doing this for its own, its own ends. Um, as a drummer, I, I, I'm not much of a uh, I'm not very good at creating melodies <laughs> or chord uh, sequences or something, but I could I could kind of create the music that I, I felt in my heart by kind of using drone and concentrating on what I could do. Um, when I went on to start working in sound art in the way I'm currently working, thinking about, well, what is the content of this? You know, even going back to the apocryphal story of how, how drone entered Western music, you have Lamont Young, this kind of composer, standing by a transformer by the highway in Montana as a kid listening to the 60 Hertz hum, right? Um, so you have you have this kind of technical phenomena right there in this, this mythological story, right? But if you listen to the world around you, you hear kind of droning processes all the time, right? Refrigerators, fans, humming of, of uh, electricity, all this stuff, right? So these are the sounds that typify technology. Um, and so they're, they're important to me personally, but also kind of into the content of my work. And, you know, they set up an interesting kind of harmony, but also contrast to kind of sustaining natural sounds, which 
in some ways are similar in other ways different, right? So um, it's a comfortable place for me to work, but one that has kind of deep content as well. So thank you for that question. Okay, um, I think that about wraps up our time unless there are any other questions. Um, I just want to thank you again so much, Kay and Andrew, for all of your time and for this really great presentation. Um, for everyone who's interested, their piece, uh, New Light Narrowcast, will be on Continuous View in um, Fine Arts Building Room 249 from 4.30 to 8 p.m. on Thursday. Um, you can go check out their piece, their pop-up piece at the, the Museum of Fine Arts right now. It's up until the 11th, right before we go on spring break. Um, but again, thank you so much and have a nice night. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Kylie. Thank you to everyone at FSU. Thank you to the wonderful grad <laughs> students we talked to today, to the audience, to the audience who are our friends who have endured this before. <laughs> You're all <laughs> lovely and we adore you and uh, we're grateful to you. Thank you. And thank you, Kay, for tolerating me. <laughs> <laughs>